Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta. And with me from London is Professor Maitri Shkhatak. He's a professor at the London School of Economics. He was educated at Presidency College in Kolkata, also at the Delhi School of Economics, and has a PhD from Harvard University. And we're going to discuss inequalities of income and wealth in India at present. Thank you so much, Professor Moitri Shkhatak, for giving us your time. Let me uh, start with a few points that you made in your recent article, which appeared on the 18th of May in Forbes, India, where you pointed out that in the financial year, which is over, which got over on the 31st of March, for the first time since the country became independent in 1947, India's economy shrank by about 8%. At the same time, they, this was a period that saw stock market indices zooming. They went up by about 75%. For the first time in the history of India, we had what, uh, would, this, what would be described as a technical recession in American terms, where in the months of April, May, and June of 2020, the economy shrank by at by almost 24%. And then in the next three months, it shrank by another 12%. And for the full year, it's roughly about 8%. Even as this happens, stock markets are booming. And of course, the number of billionaires, US dollar billionaires have gone up from 102 to 140. With their combined wealth almost doubling, to 596 billion US dollars. How do you explain this paradox? An economy in recession, stock markets booming, the number of billionaires going up. First of all, thank you, um, um, uh, Mr. Thakurta, for inviting me. Uh, I follow your writings and, and, your, uh, and, and, and your other, other uh, presence in the media with great interest. So it's a pleasure to be in your program. So. Um, I would say that first let's set a benchmark. Even in a ideal world with say no particular departure from say a competitive model of the economy that we economists like to teach in our textbooks, right? Where even in a competitive and that way frictionless world, there's no reason that GDP act each other. So we should get that out of the way. So therefore, logically, it's possible, even if something is not wrong, that the GDP could go up and down and the stock market would not necessarily uh, uh, track that. And the reason is the stock market has to do with allocation of wealth. Yeah. And the GDP has to do with current economic activity. And you know, as we know that the stock of wealth is something that has its own logic and how it's allocated. And therefore it, it, it is quite possible that the current flow of economic activity may go up and down, but the stock market will have its kind of own logic. And secondly, and relatively, the stock market has to do with the future. So for example, if you believe that, you know, two years from now, there's gonna be a big opportunity, a big uh, sort of boom happening, then uh, uh, market uh, could, could, could be booming because capital flows in, et cetera. International market conditions, right? So therefore capital can be parked from one country to another. Now I deliberately set the stage up with saying that logically there's nothing per se uh, uh, wrong with uh, the stock market and the GDP flows to sort of, you know, not move in, in, in sync. But having said that, look at the extent of it. I think that is what uh, caught your attention and that's what uh, kind of caught my uh, attention as well and many others who are observing it. And I think there are reasons to be worried about it uh, in particular because essentially what has happened during the recession as we, uh, clearly saw in the case of informal sector workers, migrant workers, whose uh, problems were uh, made very visible. The flow aspect of uh, the economy where, you know, uh, the everyday supply and demand, you know, work and, and, and uh, people's needs, they need to be sort of connected in a certain way, serious shrink. And yet what has happened is certain types of activities, certain things 
are being people are making super profits and therefore stocks of certain companies are going up because in a particular economy just to give an example that if you if you have extreme scarcity of of something the stock price of that would go off the roofs, right? And so certain people would uh, make, make huge profits out of it. So I would say for a number of reasons, I, you know, just to, uh, so even though in an ideal world, um, uh, the TP and, and stock markets, uh, there's no logical reason that they should flow with each other. In India's case, the extent of the discrepancy, and, um, you know, I haven't done a quick cross-country comparison, but there's nothing uh, stopping us from actually looking at what is going on in other economies. I think that should worry us about the nature of markets here, what entry barriers exist, et cetera. Businesses are, are doing extremely well. Stop here. So uh, what you're saying, Professor Maitrish Khatak, is that essentially, while we are not really living in an ideal world and why there is no need for the, the stock markets to reflect the reality uh, as far as the economy is concerned, the 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 discrepancies the dissonance the the divergence seems to be unduly large as far as india is concerned and if we look at what's happening now that india is in the midst of a second wave of the pandemic uh many uh, are, are of the view that what the government had claimed of a so-called V-shaped recovery, some would say a U-shaped recovery, none of that's going to materialize. In fact, there is a, a real and present danger that the economy will uh, not only not revive, but perhaps shrink in, even as we are talking. And the problem is that despite all the claims that are made by our political leaders about how we are, you know, our, our, our GDP will, double or, or whatever. I mean, I mean, and we, we're going to do very well. India will become the so-called Vishwa Guru. I'm using Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, la language. The fact is, uh, India remains very, very poor. And you yourself have pointed it out in your article that whereas about uh, India's population is roughly 17% of the world population, a little under 18% of the world's population. Soon we will become the most populous country on the planet. But about a fifth, 20.17%, according to the World Bank in 2017, one fifth of all the persons in the, on the planet who are living in extreme poverty are living in India. That is out of 689 million about 139 million. So the reality is that India remains very poor. India's economy is not growing, is likely to continue to shrink, at best grow at a very sluggish pace. As we see concentration of income and wealth continuing to grow. Absolutely. So, uh, in fact, um, let me um, uh, let me give you a, a literal example, which uh, is just your earlier question, but that will also allow me to segue into uh, the uh, you know uh, issues that you threw up in this question. So, imagine you losing your job during the recession. So, your labor income flows will stop, right? Yet, if your house is in a particular neighborhood, for others to your house could appreciate in, 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 in terms of its value. So uh, therefore, going back to, you know, I wish I had thought of that example when I was maybe expressing myself a little bit too uh, um, uh, sort of, you know, abstractly. But coming to your question, uh, this question, for the last few years in lots of my writings on the Indian economy, uh, I have expressed this frustration repeatedly, and um, uh, and and I will um, take another opportunity to express it here. That first of all, the GDP growth rate has somehow occupied the center stage of our discussions. It's almost like a, a rhetorical victory of a certain ways of looking at the economy, because see, the GDP measurement, as anybody who knows about national income accounting is very, very, uh, uh, what can you say, not a, it's an opaque process as to activity by whichever method use, et cetera. And the informal sector 
all of these uh, uh, make it a matter of a fair bit of guesswork. Now that's fair enough. We need indices and we need some measure of GDP. That's not a problem. But there are two fundamental problems of GDP uh, centered discussion and that relates um, uh, directly to your question. One is that because the GDP is a diffuse measure, if in the entire country, 99% of people actually have no change in their incomes, but 1% of the population, right, experience astronomical growth in their incomes, the GDP growth rate would still look pretty good. And that is therefore, it's a simple point. Anybody who kind of, uh, you know, thinks about or works with these numbers would know this issue, right? That the GDP is not, it's all it's saying on average, India consistent with 99% of people experiencing no growth or even a deterioration right. and 1% experiencing astronomical growth. Right? Yeah, so that's, in, that's in really... Your, in your article, you have given some of these numbers. I mean, what you're saying in, in lay terms is Mr. Ambani and Mr. Adani's income can grow. It doesn't mean that the, uh, the, the, the countries uh, or, or the, the majority of the people of the country, their incomes or their, their wealth is growing. Now, you have quoted from the World Inequalities Database compiled by people like Professor Thomas Piketty and others, where you really looked at both inequality of wealth and inequality of income. I'll briefly summarize some of the points you made. You've said that the top 1% of India's population had roughly 12% of the total wealth in the country in the three decades, from the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, 1961 to 91. And thereafter, this proportion has gone up tremendously from 12% to 42.5% in 2020. And in this period, if you look at the bottom half of the population, the bottom 50%, the share of the, the, the wealth has come down from 12, 11 and 12% roughly to a sharp fall of less than 3%, 2.8%. And you find similar figures uh, are, are there in, when you look at the figures of in, income inequality, where uh, the top 1% of the population, their, their uh, share of total income actually came down from 13% in 1961 to 7% in 1981, but then shot up to over a fifth to 21.7% in 2019. And the bottom, Half, the bottom 50% of the population, this number, this proportion from hovering around 21, 22, 23% in the 60s, 70s, and, uh, and, and, and 1961 to 81, it then collapses to under 15%, 14.7% in 2019. In other words, the so called post liberalization period, we see a sharp rise in inequalities of income and wealth, even as the rate of growth of India's gross domestic product has continued, has grown, has, has in fact accelerated. Right. So um, I would say this is the bit that one should worry about. And that relates to your earlier question that what I said that, yes, we should know GDP growth rate as much as uh, before uh, visiting a country, we need to look at its map. It's all the local variations. We took kind of a very snapshot aggregate bird's eye view. So GDP growth or GDP measurement is helpful, but relatedly it's a statistic that's reported in the, in the, in the, in the piece um, uh, that you quoted. If you look at GDP, how many times it has multiplied since the late 90s to now. So just think about these two decades, right? Late 90s to say 2019 or 20 up to which data is available. The per capita GDP has multiplied many more times than rural agricultural wage rates, right? So now, given this the number, uh, GDP per capita income, between 98 and 2019 went up eight and a half times. Rural wages went up by only 5.4 times. Exactly, thank you. So thanks for, for this, uh, those exact numbers. I didn't want to say it without checking the exact numbers. So this is the problem. And the example I was giving earlier, 
There's nothing wrong with growth. And when growth opportunities arise, some people will benefit more, some people will not benefit so much. This is also understood. But it's the question about, is that a rising tide that lifts all boats? Or is it a rising tide that systematically benefits some you know, ocean liners, whereas <clears throat> most of the other boats are struggling to stay afloat? I think that is really the main question here. So therefore, I think going back to my reservations, <clears throat> I'm sorry, GDP uh, growth rate or focus on it, is we should focus on income growth. There's nothing wrong with it. But we should ask the question uh, to uh, paraphrase like what John Kenneth Galbraith uh, had written in a speech for President Kennedy, ask not what the country can do for you, ask what you can do for the country, ask what the GDP growth rate has done for you lately, okay? You would question, we can ask it ourselves as to how people, you know, uh, in our families, in our neighborhoods are benefited, but everybody should be asking this question from the agricultural laborer to the industrial worker to the informal sector, uh, you know, tradesperson, everybody should ask that, okay, growth is fine. I mean, more opportunities, you know, more income, that's all good. But if the average growth is this, why hasn't my wage growth has kept pace with it? If the average growth is this, why aren't employment opportunities booming so that uh, my folks can come from the villages, you know, find opportunities, etc. So I think that is the key point. And now it uh, takes me to the uh, Piketty uh, initiative, which Piketty, size and many others, uh, and going back to um, the uh, work also of my former colleague at LSE uh, was passed away, Tony Atkinson, who had fundamental contributions on, on, on some of these uh, theoretical and empirical income and wealth. I think that with liberalization, certain opportunities have come up and therefore people have benefited and even poverty has gone down to some degree. So this is true, right? But the question is the disproportionate nature of the gains that have gone to the richest sections, right? And the fact that for the very lower strata and you know bottom 50% is not the very lower strata, that's half the population, right? And we are not talking about even the extreme poor here. Their income hasn't grown sufficiently. And I feel this is where we need to step out of the kind of left discourse, which says everything that happened with liberalization was wrong and we should just kind of focus on redistribution. And the right discourse that says, okay, growth is sufficient, right? I mean, with growth, everybody shall be lifted and therefore please don't, anything else is somehow a leftist kind of, uh, you know, and I let me, genuinely- Let me interrupt you here. Essentially, these two points of view, the left view and the right view is often, summarized as, uh, you know, is this ongoing debate between Professor Amr Shain and Professor Jagdish Bhagwati. And you yourself have pointed out, you know, when uh, Professor Simon Kuznets, who got the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1971, he said that when there is a rise in economic growth, there's also going to be a sharp rise in inequality, quote unquote, in the initial stages. The quote, the point is how, how long should those initial stages be? Should they be for five years, 10 years, 20 years? That is really the issue. Because what you have also written and what are more than one, uh, uh, many people have pointed out is what we are seeing in India is that the gains of growth, it's been distributed extremely unevenly. And, and it is perhaps manifest most in, in, in the lack of uh, opportunities for employment, uh, uh, for, for uh, upward mobility to use your, your words. So this, this whole thing, this uh, debate between growth versus inequality, according to you, you, you want to take a more, what should I say, a centrist view and say that, you know, it, it's uh, not either or. Am I correct? Absolutely right. So see, uh, the center is always with respect to certain polls and those polls may be a bit outdated. So I would like to think of uh, my views that the uh, view that I, and I'm not the only one, I'm not maybe framing it in this particular way, but I would say there's a broad consensus among uh, in a whole range of economists, including Piketty size to some of my former colleagues in the University of Chicago Economics Department, which has a reputation of being a fairly uh, a free market kind of place which is we need a form of progressive policy, which is not necessarily uh, opposed to creation, whether it's through private 
public investment. You know, it doesn't matter whatever creates employment opportunities, whatever creates infrastructure growth, all that is good, right? But it has to be a strongly progressive orientation of that policy that in the end, if it doesn't do much for the very ordinary uh, uh, member of the population, there will be several problems. So one problem you could say is the legitimacy problem that eventually the political capital will run out of whatever policies that are you know, leading to this, right? So that's a kind of pragmatic argument. Of course, a more serious argument is the ethical argument. You cannot be an economic superpower in the world when you have a bunch, uh, a big chunk of your population that is living in very, very abject um, conditions, right? That's number okay. two. And number three, and this is a point that I have made in several places and several of my other uh, uh, professional uh, colleagues and friends have made, um, it, and, and others have uh, shown in their work, that bringing the poor into the fold of the kind of growth experience, right, in, requires investment in education, in, in health. And that will increase supply of skilled labor because otherwise the growth engine will stop eventually. In that case, growth will peter out, right? Because after a while, you'll just run out of opportunities right. and natural resource monopolies and, and kind of, you know, really dominating protected markets can only go so far. If you're, you know, you need, a, you need the dynamism that comes from uh, skilled workers, new entrepreneurs and new innovations that would come out of this. So that's what I, so I, you know, I, I, I'm happy to now clarify any of these points. Okay. So I would say that, yes, at some point it's a centrist position, but I really do believe that there are lots of debates to be had as to how to do this. So two points, uh, the two questions rather. First question is how does India compare with other countries in the world? I, mean, I think the United States is certainly more unequal in both in terms of income and wealth. Are there other countries who are, as per the data that you have, as unequal or more unequal? I mean, how does it, uh, India compare with countries which are notoriously unequal, including South Africa, including Russia? Uh, you have said that in the, India compares very poorly with some of the European countries, but how would you place the inequality of income and wealth scenario in India in a global context? So let me let me try to try to be brief with respect to uh, um, uh, you know this is a very very uh, important question and the answer is there are two ways we can look at this so there's a way in which uh, uh, our, um, our common friend and um, um, uh, um, uh, Debraj Rai and I did a uh, article a couple of years ago where we were provoked by these uh, Oxfam type reports that every year, you know, there are this number of billionaires, et cetera, which this essay also starts off with, right? And some uh, may think that's a wonderful thing that India is competing in that league. Some may think, okay, with this much poverty, that's a terrible thing. The question is adjusting for per capita income, does India have too many of the super rich? That was the question uh, Debraj Ray and I was, were trying to answer in, in an earlier work that's linked in this particular piece. Uh, and the answer to that question is yes, there is. Even if you were to say, take a, make India's practically the same as the US per capita income, so you adjust for the fact that, you know, uh, suppose the US is uh, an advanced version of India in terms of average income. Then we can compare how many multimillionaires, billionaires the US has with India, et cetera. And that's where at what we economists technically call the very right tail, which is the extreme part of the upper uh, part of the wealth distribution. India has more thickness compared to even some of the more rich countries and unequal countries like US. So that's sort of one direct way in which one could address the question that India does have its disproportionate share of the super rich adjusting for its overall income uh, uh, levels. No, if, Number if, two, if I, I can, can If I can sort of, uh, sort of summarize what you're saying in simple language, you are saying India is relatively more unequal than most other countries in the world. Can I say that? In terms of just that measure, even if you adjust for uh, all kinds of things that you know, India is not comparable to other countries, but even if you do reasonable adjustments, yes, India has a bit of a bulging upper tail problem. And by upper tail, we mean in the wealth distribution, the very, very super rich. 
But what these tables in this article show, and you have seen them, and I'm, I'm, I, I will briefly state what it is, uh, but it, the details are there. But this is a very particular measure because you could just say, hey, that's, that's true, but maybe India is otherwise not so unequal. Maybe for the rest of the distribution of, of income and wealth, maybe India is you know, comparable with other countries. So this is where the Piketty uh, database that is very helpful and it's publicly accessible tells us is with some exceptions, you know, the US being an exception, uh, South Korea being an exception, and there are some exceptions among economies which have huge overall GDP, right? So, you know, and that includes France, Germany, et cetera. India is still uh, quite unequal if we compare the income share of the top 10% and the income share of the bottom 50%. And same holds for wealth. So even among this, India is not at the very top. But even like you said, South Africa, for example, is more unequal, absolutely. But India still, if you look among major economies, India does seem to have a more uh, you know, greater inequality problem. Okay, my last question to you. What's the way forward? You know, uh, we all say that rich needs to be taxed the most, but they're not, whether in the US, whether in India. In fact, uh, many argue that the, the rich are getting more and more tax breaks, tax sops, call them what you like. Uh, and we also find that the entire uh, taxation system is quite regressive. I mean, take India. Uh, when you, if you look at direct taxes, it's about a third of the total tax collections of the government of India. Whereas uh, two thirds of the taxes are paid by all sections of the population, rich or poor, and therefore inherently regressive. So uh, it's good to say tax the rich, spend it on healthcare, spend it on education, both are very, very sorely needed in a country like India, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, one could say it's because of the nexus between big business and politics, and the fact is big business is indeed heavily invested. And, 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 and given the way political funding happens, uh, this nexus is preventing the uh, taxation or, or, or the rich being taxed more than they are being at present. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right that uh, it is not very difficult uh, to point to the general area of the solution. You can bring the horse to the water. That's an entirely different challenge, right? And we exactly know that for political economy reasons, you can advocate capital taxes, wealth taxes of various kinds, right? But is it realistic that that's going to happen uh, very soon? Even some of the capital gains tax raises that happen have been to some degree, you know, uh, uh, rolled back, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that happened a couple of years ago. So I really think that uh, other than a kind of sustained uh, sort of demand that a fair distribution of the tax bill has to happen, and like you said that, you know, the fact is India's tax system is not particularly progressive and compared to peer countries or compared to developed countries, etc. And correspondingly, the public service are living through the pandemic, we are seeing some of the problems that uh, are happening in the public, uh, public health uh, domain with the lack of in infrastructure and, and, and the problems we are facing. So see, it is very tempting to say something very, very catchy and, and, and kind of magic bullet like and people are thinking of maybe universal basic income and I have some sympathies for a modified version of it, etc. But clearly that's not a that's not a magic solution, but I would say kind of a consensus around everybody having to pay a fair share of taxes, bringing those who are in the informal sector, but not poor bringing them under the tax net, some of them, there should be consensus around these things. And I think we can only start with the consensus and putting pressure on, in terms of, you know, having, having a demand that these, uh, these uh, need to be done. Now, the only note of optimism, if one can muster such in the other one, is given the hole that this crisis has left in the budget, in a way, every crisis is also an opportunity. Right, uh, I think there's a U.S. politician. Some say it's Ram Emanuel, but you know there are others who are um, um, attributed um, this quote to a bit that of a never waste a crisis. Yeah, exactly, that never waste a crisis, right? 
So I would say we have a perfect opportunity that given the budgetary crisis that you said that normally direct and indirect taxes are more equal share, right? But right now they've become disproportionately direct taxes are around one third, as you said. We really need to have a, a, a kind of opportunity to put certain forms of taxation on the table and a consensus from the progressive as well as more pro-business uh, ends of the spectrum that you know when some massive crisis happens, we have to pick up after it, right? We have to pick up the pieces. Kind of emerges that we have to collectively foot the bill and everybody has to chip in and, and we have to protect the most vulnerable. That is a sound fiscal principle in any system. It doesn't have to be particularly left-wing view of the world, but that's my hope, uh, uh, Paranjay. Okay. I, I wish I could say something more concrete okay. and, and, and uh, that, that, but uh, that's where we are circling. So okay. hopefully there'll be political will for this. Thank you so much, Professor Moitrish Ghatok for giving us your time, giving us your views, explaining why despite the recession in the economy, stock markets continue to boom, why we've seen in the recent past inequalities of income and wealth in this country having widened, making India one of the most unequal countries on the planet. Thank you once again for being with us and keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.